Okay, um, today I'm going to talk a lot about passion and this is one thing um, that I stand by. Sometimes passion feels good and nice. How many of you guys consider yourself passionate people? Most of you guys in this room will consider yourself passionate people. Um, but sometimes it means being angry at injustice and doing something about it. I don't know whether it's right of me to ask this question, but I'll go for it. <laughs> okay, how many of you guys are um, unhappy with the current situation Malaysia is currently in? Almost the whole room. Good job. Um, I'm, I believe that many of us are angry. Um, how many of you guys... Um, sorry? Yeah. How many of you guys feel that... Um, how many of you guys feel that the less fortunate should be treated better and given more opportunities. How many of you have at least one thing that you hope to see change in our country? More than one. More than one. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, and maybe by the end of my session, it would be asking yourself, what can you do to contribute to that change? Um, so today, I'm going to talk about something very passionate about. Um, and I'm going to share statistics. Um, um, so I'm passionate about refugees. Uh, I'm going to just share a bit of statistics in the world currently, um, just so that we know where we are going tonight. Um, one in every 122 people on the planet is now either a refugee, internally displaced, or seeking asylum. One in every 122 people. I believe that we all have, um, you know, a group of more than 122 friends and acquaintances and families and relatives. Imagine one in every 122 people on the planet is now either a refugee, internally displaced, or seeking, seeking asylum. At the end of um, 2014, the current statistics for number of people forcibly displaced at the end of 2014 was 59.5 million. That makes up close to 60 million people. Yeah, more than that. So what is 60 million people? Um, what does 60 million people look like? If 60 million was a population in a country, it would be the 24th largest country in the world. The only reason why I'm presenting you with facts from the end of 2014 is because I couldn't find facts related to 2015. Um, but yeah, if 60 million were population of a country, it would be the 24th largest country in the world. Um, 60 million in days, numbers and minutes also means 42,500 people displaced every single day. That if you break that down to the number of people um, every second, it will be one person possibly every other second. Um, if you, that is the world statistics. And sometimes um, I know that when we look at the world in a whole, we don't feel so greatly affected because we are not very much linked to the different parts of the world. So let me share with you the statistics in Malaysia. Um, as of end of 2015, just last month, um, there are 156,340 refugees and asylum seekers registered with UNHCR. Um, and these are just the number of people who have been registered. There are plenty, plenty, a lot more who have not been registered and are waiting, um, are waiting to be registered. Out of which 33,640 of them are children below the age of 18. School going ages. Um, and 33,640 of them, only 40 of them receive access to basic education here in Malaysia. And basic education isn't, isn't even formal education, like going to government schools. It's really just um, going to community-based schools where NGOs and um, different organizations help out at. So let me tell you a bit more about myself. So my name is Heidi, as introduced. Um, I'm currently 21 years old. I'm also the founder and director of a non-profit organization called Refuge for the Refugees. I'm also a student doing my degree in accounting and finance. So Refuge for the Refugees was established back in 2012, September. A fun fact would be just a couple of days after, um, after RFTR was established as a proper organization, I came to Incitement, and Incitement was actually the first community that celebrated our milestone with us. So yay! <laughs> Yeah.
Refuge for the Refugees focuses a lot on raising awareness regarding status of refugees in Malaysia, as well as providing education for refugee children. Um, how we started was, uh, I think about, once I finished high school, I see someone in DJ here wearing the dynamite shirt. Someone in DJ wearing the dynamite shirt? Yes. Hello! Yeah, so I was from Naman Sarjaya as well. Are you still currently a student? No, okay, graduated. Yeah, so once I finished high school, I about four months before entering college, when I decided, you know, hey, why don't I do something productive in my time, something meaningful, something that will make an impact. So I walked, so I, so I went around asking people, you know, what can I do? And this lady, a good friend of mine, told me about this refugee school in Sungai Basi that was really in need of English teachers. That was then when I thought, you know, hey, why not just um, volunteer during these four months while well, I'm still on a break and continue on with life after. I know that growing up in um, most Asian families, our parents will tell us to focus on education, focus on ourselves, focus on building a career and a future for ourselves. So um, just like any of them, I went along that path and thought to myself, you know, four months and I'm done. I'm done with this community and I move on with life after. But little did I know that these four months would turn out to be a lifelong commitment. So um, about our fourth month into volunteering, when I was done with volunteering, I walked into the headmaster's office and I told him, hey, you know what, I'm done volunteering. Um, I won't be coming in anymore next week. And he told me, hey, you know what, it's fine because um, school will be closed next week onwards due to lack of funds and these kids will not be able to come to school anymore so they don't need teachers and then when it and, and it was then that it really struck me you know how can these kids be robbed of their only access to education simply because of the lack of funds so we started refuge for the refugees back in um, back as a project first we got amazing support from people People were really, really generous towards giving and we realised that this is just one school in the 180 refugee schools, at, um, refugee schools in KL and there's, I mean, it's just one school, there's so many more schools that are in need of support. So, um, with that we decided to go on with our venture to start up um, RFTR as an NGO um, and with that we were established back in 2012. So we started with just one school, today we have six schools, five across Klang Valley, um, Ampang, Sungai Basi, Sawi, Mentari, Damansara, Jaya, and Section 17, and one in Penang in Bukit Matajam. Um, and we have 700 kids impacted on a daily basis. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, I just just sharing a bit more about my journey with RSTR. I never really saw myself doing what I do today. Um, I never really saw myself advocating for refugees, but over the past three years, um, besides Besides running an NGO, so, so some of you may wonder what does running an NGO until um, really it, you do everything. First, I, I first started off as a volunteer teacher and I'm still a teacher at the refugee schools. Um, the kids have become very much like my own kids and a lot of times people have mistaken me as one of them because apparently I look like a Burmese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's time we take photos with the children. Um, my friends will have trouble pointing out who am I and where am I because we look exactly alike. Um, yeah, so we started off, when I first started off teaching in Sungai Basi three years ago, um, these kids could not read and write. Um, these kids could not um, speak a word of English. These kids um, really did not know where they were heading um, in, their, in, in the future. But today, the very same kids who couldn't read and write can now write essays. The very same kids who couldn't speak a word of English are now English teachers at other refugee schools. And despite, um, you know, the crazy things we go through with our authorities here in Malaysia, uh, I lost track of the number of times we got into trouble with the authorities simply because we were working with refugees. Um, we were beaten up, we were robbed, we were... Um, I remember there's once, somewhere in July last year when we were helping with the whole Rohingya boat situation, um, we, were, we suddenly received an email um, during that week we were helping out, um, helping the Rohingyas and um, the authorities actually told us that we were summoned under a sudden investigation and they wanted to come and raid our office. So our office, because we're still students, happens to be my best friend's house. So imagine the authorities coming to your house and raiding it. I think it's quite an unpleasant experience. Um, but that happened. We were summoned under a sudden investigation. They came through, they looked through all our documents and they couldn't pinpoint an issue. Um, they couldn't pin pinpoint exactly what, what was wrong with us. They just weren't happy with the work we were doing. Um, every day includes, besides teaching, besides managing schools, so what RFTR does for these schools is that we, we pay the salary of the Burmese teachers, 
we help input um, a proper syllabus for the schools. Um, we train volunteers, and we yeah we make sure that the schools function as much as a, like a school as possible. So yeah, so um, every now and then we do have police raids coming into the school. I'm not too sure how many of you guys are aware of the current refugee situation now in Malaysia, where over the past week or so the police have been going into communities, detaining all kids and all adults. Um, and train them to detention centers. I wish I had more time today to actually show you guys the whole Al Jazeera video done by Steve Chow. Not too sure how many guys have watched it. Um, Steve Chow is an investigative journalist with Al Jazeera and he actually did a video documenting lives of refugees in Malaysia and what goes on behind the bars of the de detention camps. It's really an, an amazingly eye-opening video which you have to watch. So over the past three years, I've also been given the opportunity to travel um, to, to train, to help young people discover, young people like you and I, discover their fullest potential. Um, I wish I had pictures, but I, I didn't have time to compile the pictures together. Um, just last year, I actually represented Malaysia to go for the Turner Youth Forum um, in Norway, where I got to attend the Nobel Peace Prize Award ceremony as well. Yeah. That, that really was an amazing opportunity being trained by, um, we got trained by the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales. Um, we got trained by, I can't remember his name, but he founded Minecraft. And he was actually teaching us how to use Minecraft um, to further, I mean to teach, the, to, yeah, how to use Minecraft for education. And I never thought that you could actually use computer games to teach kids. Um, but yeah, I mean it was, it was a very, very insightful, um, it was a very, very insightful um, conference. The Nobel Peace Prize ceremony was really the highlight of my entire year last year. Just sitting with the, um, just sitting in a ceremony and listening to um, how the Tunisian Quartet, you know, fought their way through for the many, many years and finally, eventually, um, rose victoriously and, and, and won the battle. So I'm not too sure. Um, I think the whole RCR story is a bit difficult to, how much time do I have left? One minute, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up, I think we'll have, I mean, after incitement, you can approach me and ask me more about my journey with RFTR, and um, I know there's some of you in the room who may um, be interested in, in starting your own startups or starting your own projects, especially working with underprivileged communities. Um, some of you may have questions. Every day I get questions like, you know, how do I start my own organization? How do I sustain it? How do I um, keep it going? Um, how do I, which, which authorities do I have to approach, um, who do I have to register under. There's always plenty of questions and different technicalities that we can go into, um, which you can approach me and ask me after we're done. Um, just a few closing thoughts, maybe a few closing thoughts um, that I hope all of you guys think about would be, what is passion to you? Um, what are you passionate about? And how can you use passion to aid community development work? Since, we are, since just now um, we touched on the topic of using the internet to do good, um, there's plenty of ways really we can use the internet to make a difference. I mean, every now and then, one of the reasons why um, sometimes I try to stay off Facebook is because a lot of times when I scroll through my Facebook feed, I realize that there's a lot of negativity going on. Um, I mean, I'm sure that all of you guys will scroll through your Facebook feed and see at least one friend complaining about things that are not right in our country. One friend dissing the government, one friend, you know, talking about what's not right. But what's the point of putting um, people down when we ourselves are not doing something to make a difference? So how can you use your passion to aid community development work? Or how can you use, I mean, to put it in a different context, how can you use your passion um, to make a difference? One of the reasons why I try very much to keep within my time frame is because I like to tell you that, um, and, and I didn't share too much about my journey with RCR, is because um, just so you know, within the past 20 minutes, according to statistics, within the past 20 minutes, there's been some 600 people that have been forced to flee due to persecution and war, 600 people who became refugees and asylum seekers. This is what happens within 20 minutes. Um, so something to think about, what is passion to you and how can you use your passion to aid community development work? Thank you.